Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Everyday Organizational Designs, otherwise known as EOD Global. This is part of our monthly webinar series where we have candid and sometimes uncomfortable conversations about all things diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and justice related. So today we're going to talk about how toxic privilege impacts us both society in society and in the workplace. And so you might ask why this term privilege is important to discuss. And I think there are two reasons it is a critical part of today's conversation. Number one, many don't understand the meaning of the term privilege, and therefore they immediately take offense at the use of it. And number two, we live in a society where privilege, power, any inequality is loudly displayed, is unapologetically unapolog displayed, and it continues to persist despite the outcry that many have for change. And unless we talk about it, unless we raise those concerns and call it out and call a thing a thing, the negative impacts of privilege will continue. <laughs> and so today we're gonna call a thing a thing, especially when it's talking about toxic privilege. So but before we jump into the conversation, uh, we have Dr. Vic Baker with us. We were going to have a colleague, Janine Brown, offering prayers to her. She's dealing with a family situation. But Dr. Vic Baker and I, we're going we're gonna to hold it down and have this discussion today. Uh, but first, I want him to introduce himself and tell us about himself, his, his company, and his uh, relationship with DEI. Thank you. I appreciate that, Daryl. It is wonderful, again, to be amongst such uh, great people and leaders in this environment. I, I feel so privileged. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Vic Baker. I always start my introduction by saying I'm a recovering engineer because my background is in engineering. I spent uh, and am spending currently, I'm 25 years in energy profession and an executive in the energy uh, field. I had the pleasure of working in uh, actually for the country's first four female CEOs of Fortune in, uh, in Energy Companies. Uh, so let me give a shout out just real quick to Deborah Reed, Yasha Williams, Caroline Wynn, and Patty Poppy, because they do deserve their flowers for being uh, leaders in this industry, and I've had the privilege to work with them. Since we're going to be talking about privilege, we're also going to be talking about a little bit of gender privilege, right? And, uh, and so I, I have some insight just working in the industry. But also, uh, I'm a guest lecturer at UC Berkeley, University of San Francisco, and I speak uh, directly to justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, environmental leadership, executive leadership. Uh, I'm a senior partner in a company called Equitify. Uh, it's the executive leadership training and coaching, organizational structure and performance or, and organizational diversity. And we also work in supplier diversity as well. But all that said, my personal life, when we're talking about privilege, I'm the youngest of six boys, and my father is the oldest of 10. So when we talk about privilege and masculinity and toxic masculinity and toxic privilege, uh, I'm gonna have some insight in how that, uh, how that played out, one, in a personal level, and two, uh, in my role as an executive in an energy company here in uh, Southern California. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, and for those of you who have not joined us before, my name is Daryl Lynn Swift, and I am the Chief People Officer of EOD Global. We're a global uh, organizational development organization, and our primary focus is on leadership and on DEI strategy, training. Uh, we have online products that are phenomenal to help make an actual change in the way people view themselves and their relationships with uh, others who have different identities and how to become an ally and much more. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about privilege. And I, I find that the term privilege seems to cause a negative reaction to some. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think some people don't understand what the term means in the DEI space specifically. Uh, in your research and your work, Dr. Baker, how best would you define the term privilege? And can you speak to the thought by some that the word has been used to rep weaponize people on both sides, but more specifically that the term privilege 
has been used to make people feel guilty about what they have no control over. I love how you ended that, what they have no control over, because really we only have control over ourselves. So the idea of privilege is something that is out of our hands in a lot of places. But to identify that uh, one has privilege means they have the power and the authority to make actionable items, uh, actionable circumstances, right? Um, it, it's similar to being racist versus being a bigot. If you have no power or authority, the word privilege is not, it, it, it doesn't exist, right? It's just, uh, it, it, it's just who we are as individuals and our differences. But inver invariably, you know, when we talk about gender differences and gender privileges, we immediately go to the macho behavior of traditional men in the workplace. We talk uh, in the kind of unspoken context of traditionalism, the sexist macho style often falls uh, across uh, racial lines as well. And it goes to mm -hmm. our black men, our Latino men, our immigrants and kind of our working class men as being this macho thing in this workplace. And the idea of privilege goes right along with that because as men experience these, as, as we experience this kind of competitive nature amongst us, the underlying aspect of that is that we are deeming or de demonizing our female counterparts, our, our women in, the, in that section. So, and we're, what we're recognizing is that because it's toxic, this is what makes it toxic in my opinion, is that we see a win in doing that. Mm -hmm. As we continue to do it, we, we have, we get this kind of conditional, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, kind of a conditional accountability or self-worth from other men as we continue to exude this type of, uh, this preference, which means we elevate in our company because we're seeing likeness of one another. We elevate and so we continue to perpetuate this mechanism that says if we demonize women, if we, don't give them the privilege. Remember, don't give, meaning I have power uh, to give them uh, the, the authority to do what they need to do and how they want to do it and, and, and those actions and speaking in those terms, then we will continue to uh, live on a higher end of this zero sum game that we as men think that exists in this in the corporate world. There is no zero sum game. There's enough to go around. Right. And I should not be getting my self worth by demonizing others, uh, whether I do it consciously or unconsciously. Mm -hmm. So, Darlene, you asked me the question of why uh, why uh, people weaponize it on on either end, and quite frankly, it has to do with people being scared on a man. Yes, we are scared of losing our status. White people are scared of losing our status. Hence, why we saw you know, what happened in Buffalo, New York, and these other places. We are scared of losing where we are, who we are, which makes you should automatically, by being scared, you should know then that there is some unjust behavior that exists. You know, it's so interesting that you started with the gender part and you talked about the intersectionality of gender and race as well. Uh, I want to start with what happened in Buffalo and then work back to uh, how things apply in the workspace. So it's really interesting that an 18 year old armed male, white male, uh, with a semi automatic assault rifle using the N word. Uh, began shooting in the grocery store and was able to walk away, right? Shots were piercing through the air. People were running for their, their lives. People were protecting others. And this teenager who was later identified by police as having camouflage on, he was draped in body armor. He wore a camera to capture this rampage. And when the shooting stopped, how I don't remember exactly how many people have had been killed, but at that point, 11 of them uh, were black, that were shot were black. He was captured by police when he left the grocery store. And that night or Saturday night, he was arraigned. So many people will say, 
had that been a black or a brown person, what would the outcome have been? And there have been countless numbers of uh, information that has come forth that has just shown the disparity between what happens throughout the races when we have some type of a, a violence against other races. So we have to call a thing a thing. And that's, that's a privilege. His a privilege is an unearned right. It's an unearned uh, pass mm -hmm. because of an identity you hold. And so you mentioned gender, you mentioned race, there's social economic privilege, there's uh, ability privilege, there is many types of privileges, there is, you know, neurodiversity privilege, and we have to think about the fact that because of identities we hold, we can move through the world differently. Mm -hmm. There are many things that someone else can do that I, as a black woman, could not do without thinking about how it's gonna impact me because it's gonna impact me negatively where it would not impact someone else negatively. So I think it's really important to just think about privilege as being that unearned right or an unearned pass. And when you think about it that way, it should help you to take out the guilt. We're not saying that you haven't worked hard. We're not saying you're not a good person. We're not saying you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. What we are saying when we talk about privilege is that simply being of an identity, you can move through the world with some unearned right. So when we take it down to that core, it really should minimize people's negativity to the term. But I mean, I, I understand that that's how people react to it. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they don't understand it. And that is why they have that negative reaction. But when you look at privilege at its core, mm -hmm. and this is something you said, Dr. Baker, the people with privilege are the ones that have the responsibility to help change how other people are treated differently, right? Absolutely. So let's talk about that when it comes to the workplace. You talked about um, the male toxicity in the workplace. And I'm glad you started there because there's a lot of male versus female interactions that are viewed differently. So let me give you an example. And maybe you could speak further to this. As a woman, and especially as a woman of color, my passion, my assertiveness will be looked at many times as a negative, where a man, he's being powerful. He's being compa uh, uh, passionate, but he's being powerful. And it's looked at as a positive. So where do you think those disparities, where do you think that started? Oh my goodness, where do I think it started? Uh, let's, let's just, for, for one, at the very onset of this, talk about that exact thing. The fact that you're looked upon with the same attributes in a different, from a different lens. And it's negative when it comes to a black woman, it's positive when it's talked about a white male, right? That yes. itself, that privilege, and, and, and that is the unearned right that you speak of. So. You know, we it's it's interesting you talk about that, and we can go way back. We can, matter of fact, who was it? Uh, Scott Coltrane, 1992, did a study of over 93 non-industrial societies, uh, and these are where he studied predominantly. These societies were men-controlled property and were had a little distant relationship from their children. And what he learned was these things: public displays of de uh, denigration of women right? Uh, vociferous or oratory, meaning that we spoke negative toward women. He talked about ceremonial warfare. He talked about sexual violence against women. I'm going to stop there with those four points and consider those four items where men controlled property and had distant relationship with their children. And I want you to take a step back and look at what we're depicting in our rap culture today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm young males today, or we're depicting what does that look like in our Black culture and how that has infiltrated into us uh, as, uh, in our culture. Now, by contrast, 
when we talk about women who have control over property and men have a closer relationship with their children, they infrequently affirm, they infrequently affirm their manliness. Mm -hmm. so no need for men to dominate others anymore. Uh, instead, the, the, there's a direct variable and it, their, their masculinity varies according to the extent of their power and privilege, which is minimized. So now uh, men continue to, uh, while they continue to benefit from oppressing women, the opportunity to oppress women is limited. All right. And so what we wanna, what the purpose of me saying that is um, when, we, when we readjust and realign and offer the opportunity for women to take leadership roles as their proper space, proper cultural, proper uh, uh, ability to nurture, we see that men in their natural tendency to be competitive is minimized. Mm -hmm. We don't see that we have the United States. When we don't see that we have America, and we have to take into consideration that Americans diversity is not as diverse as the rest of the globe. Right. We don't recognize that, right? We think that because we're the most powerful, we're the most powerful because white men control it. Yes. And so diversity is actually profitable, right? It makes sense, right? Diversity is actually yeah. profitable, which means we, we perpetuate this diversity. But we're going to talk a little later, Daryl, and when we get to these statistics uh, and talk about how how disillusioned we are with profitability and the mm -hmm. diversity. Because, okay, that'll be great. Right, we're 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 thinking today that uh, I, I would say that the unconscious bias is that we're going to continue to be in this role, this segmented role of men over women, uh, because we continue to be uh, instigated, and there's a there's a proportion of us who still believe that the world is better if men have control. Right. And that's, that is just really unfortunate. It is. It's, it's interesting you, you share this. Uh, we taught a class um, a couple of weeks ago at Stanford. And one of the things that we talked about was uh, unconscious bias in performance management. Mm -hmm. And we shared the difference of men versus women and how they're viewed and how they're evaluated and how women have to walk this tight rope. And at every step of the way, we have to evaluate our actions. What will my action be looked at or looked like? And how will I be evaluated if I do the same thing that a, a man does? And the truth of the matter is we're deemed negatively on both ends. We're deemed for not being as vocal because we'll be seen as aggressive. Uh, but then we're also deemed when we're quiet because we're not speaking up. Mm -hmm. So it's a double-edged sword. We, you know, women have to walk this tightrope and evaluate every step of the way. How can I or how should I behave and respond in every situation? Because it's going to impact me, which impacts my my evaluation, which impacts my money right. differently. And, and so I, we have to be really careful. You, you mentioned the informal, uh, the informal evaluation, and then there's the formal one. Yes. And there needs to be more study. Part of, part of you know, some of the things that I've looked at in, in, in my studies is what are the languages? What are the words being used to evaluate us in a gender, uh, based on gender, based on race, based on ethnicity? Mm -hmm. What are the words that are used to evaluate us? And who is evaluating us? Mm -hmm. Right? And mm -hmm. not enough research has done, gone into it. And when we, when we talk about the things that we as corporations and executives and corporations should be doing is really earmarking where unconscious bias may show up. It's going right. to show up in policies and procedures right? Mm -hmm. what paper is what's going to run an organization because you always fall back to saying, this is what we're supposed to do. And the second piece of that is how we evaluate. So if I'm evaluating Daryl in and in using terms that aren't going to serve in a positive manner for her to increase and move up in the company, she's going to stay stagnant. She's going right. to 
in, in, in a role that's beneath her abilities. And we're never going to benefit from her excellence and her maturity and what she can bring to the table, uh, mm-hmm. a holistic view, because we see it as not our norm as uh, number one as men, especially if you have a white man evaluating you, uh, but, but in a men in general evaluating you. And we should be conscious of, of, of the, that terminology that we use. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where the combination of bias and toxic privilege comes in, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, another example that we dealt with recently was one of our clients contacted us about a uh, guest to their, to their facility, which they don't have control over how guests act and respond. Mm-hmm. But one guest acted very inappropriately toward a Hispanic male. Um, mm-hmm. There was a physical contact that was inappropriate. Mm-hmm. And the Hispanic male was nervous, but did not respond in a way to shut it down, right? Mm-hmm. Which he had the right to do because they inv- invaded his personal space. During the investigation, when they asked him why didn't you speak up and say something to them in that moment? And there was a witness there. He said two things. Number one, as a male, I wasn't sure how to respond to the females Mm -hmm. because I did not want them to feel uncomfortable. Right. And number two, it it just happened to be that they were white women. Mm -hmm. He said, I didn't think I'd be believed. So it works on both sides, that, that toxic privilege and the biases work on both sides. Many times when we're talking about leadership, it's the male toxic privilege. But yeah. sometimes when we're talking about it from a service side, it can be the other way around. That situation just happened to be white women. It could be any other woman who a man might not know how to respond to in a service interaction. So I think it's important to show that in our workspace, we've got to look at the different areas that that can come from. That's right, and and also not uh, in, not everything is going to be race or gender based. Right. Some could just be we don't get along. That is okay as well. We need to look at right consistent messages from leaders. Are they being consistent along these rant the, these lines, or are there one offs or inconsistencies there? But you mentioned you mentioned investigation. Now, I have a hard time uh, just being in industry, being in a large corporation where our investigations of gender and ethnic bias don't have investigators who are gender or ethnically biased. Yes. Right, that's an issue. (laughs) Yes. That's a concern, right? It's like, hold on a minute, how is this investigation being handled when you don't understand or have any insight to what I may be going through or do you know what to look for? Right, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. we have this investigation that that uh, that we use the term a lot, and so I, I definitely think that we as organizations can do better in that area. Right, absolutely. Two, the second piece of that is um, the the hierarchy. When we talk about the hierarchy, uh, white men, black men, white women, right neck and neck, and then black women way down on the totem pole. Right, and then Hispanics are typically at the bottom, toward the bottom in all the studies. Toward the bottom, uh, we, mm-hmm. we understand. And then we talk about uh, immigrants who come into the United States. And we talk mm-hmm. about as you migrate into the United States, you get, you get accepted into a culture, into the dominant salient culture, if you learn how to degrade others. Does mm-hmm. that make sense sometimes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so on a, on a racial basis, you see it all the time. On a gender basis, some of these cultures, as they come into United States, they already have the gender di- you know, uh, dysfunction as they bring it into the culture. We have to re-educate on that and say, hold on, we don't treat people this way. And yes, the female will be your boss <laughs> and you have to deal with that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so we have to be cognizant of, of, of one, the consistency of leaders versus the one-off the dislike versus the um, uh, exercising unconscious bias and uh, Mm -hmm. unfortunate privilege 
uh, in the terms of demeaning and keeping people from uh, feeling belonged at the at their uh, work environment. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that you you talked about was um, trying to identify leaders being able to identify when it's a difference between just people not liking each other or getting not getting along or just not being able to connect to when those biases come into play. So one of the um, things that we'll talk about in a uh, topics we'll talk about in a future webinar is trauma informed supervision. Yeah, because yeah. there's so much going on out in the world that people come into the workspace and they're cloaked with, with trauma. They're cloaked with trauma. They're cloaked with pain. Uh, I have a client who did one of the best things I've seen in a long time. And after the Buffalo shooting that next uh, Monday, we had a staff meet, a manager's meeting. And I typically sit in on the manager's meeting and he gave everyone the space and the grace to speak about what was going on and how they were feeling. So I thought that was very important to be able to allow people to have those emotional um, interactions even in the workplace and to be able to ask the right questions to know what your people are feeling and what they're dealing with. So in those times, you can start to see that there's no way people can come to work and perform normally. There's no way when people are being attacked that look like me, that I'm going to walk into my office the next day and everything be okay. It's not possible. I will be cloaked with the trauma, the, the pain of what's happening to my people. I will be cloaked with the trauma and the pain of looking at the number of people who were taken out that look like my mom, that look like my brother, that look like my grandson. That is that is scary. That is emotional. But people expect you to go into work the next day and perform as though everything is okay, which is unfortunate. It is unfortunate that we do that. So with trauma-informed supervision, you start to look for some of those signs that your staff's in dis distress. You start to look for uh, especially when there are shifts in what they've done before versus how they're performing now. You start to look for those shifts and you start to identify the trauma. So we'll talk about that uh, at a later webinar. But the question that that all leads to is what can some leaders look for to identify when toxic privilege exists? What are some of the signs that you've seen that can affect staff and their organizational culture? Oh man, it's hard for me not to respond to what you just said, though. I, go, I, ahead. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but you touched on this. If you open the Pandora's box here, I, I want to talk I about did. that, right? And and can I just add to the fact that we are going to walk into the door with trauma after something that happened in the Black Church on the East Coast and uh, Buffalo and a target of Black people. One is the trauma of exactly what you said, people who look like me and I'm identified as that person. You can't look at me and not see black. It yeah. is what it is. But let me add something to you. How about being in those, uh, showing up at work and still not recognizing who may be okay with it? Mm -hmm. Who is, who doesn't see a problem with it? Mm -hmm. Ugh. Right. You sit next to them. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's no big deal. They probably deserved it. Yeah. Or, right. Exactly. So I, I just want to drop that. Uh, that just sent up my spine. It's anxiety because it's, it's the trauma, but it's the anxiety of being around people. You got to understand that as we, as generationally, as we learn about historical violence that has happened to our folk, uh, happened to our people, and, and for you as women, happened to women. As we get more informed about things that were hidden and, and it comes to light, we, we also have to think about the people who did it. How are they re-educated through generational, generations? Or are they re-educated? Are they? Right. We don't, we don't spend enough time on the oppressors and their education of the oppressors 
into a place of non-oppression, but mm -hmm. we expect that that doesn't happen anymore. How did it happen? How did it not happen anymore? Right. Right. <laughs> Law or because uh, because there was a strategic uh, uh, education process to teach oppressors not to oppress. I don't, I've never seen an education of teaching oppressors not to oppress, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen mm -hmm. it. What I've seen is as, as the oppressed, we've been asked to change our ways of being. Right? Exactly. Nice, right? So right. It's, it's, you know, the woman who gets raped versus and blaming the woman who gets raped kind of thing. And, no, it, we, it is. We can't blame the victim. It is. But, uh, but along the lines of, of privilege and how to identify uh, privilege uh, uh, and how we as leaders need to learn how to identify, I think it's done along the same uh, alignment is recognizing that people show up different. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to, uh, one particular way is uh, I want to always um, make sure that I have goals oriented around these types of issues. So I need to have diversity goals. I need diversity goals need to be policy driven diversity goals. Mm -hmm. And I need to be aware as we go from year over year from six months every six months, understanding, hey, how are you promoting people? How are they being evaluated? Um, who's in my leadership position, what does it look like? What is my, uh, my what, what do they call my kitchen cabinet look like, right? Those are the people that are closest to you in your environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I had 1600 employees, but only had 32 who directly reported to me, if that makes sense. So my kitchen cabinet, I need to make for sure, I need to be watching, where are you at? And where are you making these changes and calling out their consistencies along these environments? Hey, why do they all look like you? They all mm -hmm. come from mm -hmm. the same socioeconomic. Why do you hire everybody from Harvard? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Why did, why did you, why did most of the people that you promoted, um, you know, participate in this organization with your kids? I don't know. But whatever it may be, the, let's, let's look at how you're aligning this and what that structure looks like and say, mm -hmm. hey, I, this is, I'm going to hold you accountable. For making a change here because right now i don't think you recognize it but this is some unconscious bias whether you recognize it or not as a leader i recognize it and i'm going to implement some goals now for you to meet whether you like right. it. If you don't want to sign up for me we can we can work something else out <laughs> right right this might not be the good fit <laughs> it might not be a good culture fit we had a a, a, a training it's been about right before COVID happened mm -hmm. and in the training class with some managers, this man had enough. He had enough of me. Yeah. And he literally said, look, I can tell you, you have some sensibilities about being black and being a woman. Oh, because, oh, no, 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 this is what he said. He said, because see, I'm up here, you're down here. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to bring me down to your level. Oh. Now, oh, you know, I had to take a deep breath, right? Took two or three. <laughs> and I said to him, but, but right, right. <laughs> Wusa, but he was surprised with my response. And I thought about it and I said, I think I'm going to agree with you. He sat back. I said, if, you, if you're talking about the fact, that policies, procedures, laws were created hundreds of years ago to protect you. If you're talking about the fact that uh, as a society, you all had 246 years uh, of a head start on people of color, period. If you're talking about the fact that once slavery semi ended in the United States, there were different ways that people found to keep us down, whether it was redlining or whether it was uh, the Freedmen Savings Bank debacle or whether it was the many examples of uh, the Tulsa massacre. Oh. Um, and I can give you many more. I said those were specifically done so that Blacks, Hispanics could not reach a level of parity. And I believe the reason you don't want us to reach a level of parity is because of fear of what will happen 
when we do. So if you're talking about you being up here because you have more advantage before you have, because you have the toxic privilege, then I agree that you have that. What I don't agree with is you're saying, I want you to come down here. No, what I'm saying is we should all be at a level of equity and that's what's not happening. Now, what was interesting with the, with the comment and the discussion, it ended up being like a five, seven minute discussion mm -hmm. is everybody in the room was silent. After we left, the director who I'd not dealt with called me. I was ready to lose the contract. That was fine. Uh -huh. And said to me, I heard what happened. I apologize. And they were going to deal with this manager. And the way they were going to deal with him was to fire him. And oh. I said, I prefer, I said, I prefer you don't. Oh. I prefer you don't. This man actually was brave enough yes. to speak his truth. And only if he spoke his truth could I start the educational process. What I would prefer for you to do, and you, you talked about when the oppressor had no education to, uh, uh, to educate the oppressor, what I would prefer you do is let's put him through a program, let's give him some coaching, let's uncover what his beliefs and his values are that has him making those comments. And then I said to her, and let's uncover your culture because he was brave enough and yeah. felt yeah. easy enough to be able to say that to me. Mm -hmm. She yeah. said, ouch, that hurts, but you're right. That was the response. So yeah. I think it's really important. Again, we got to call a thing a thing and quit being silent. And we've mm -hmm. talked a lot about race and gender. That's not just it. It's age. As mm -hmm. a 60-year-old woman, I will tell you that young people are not going to look at me in the same way that another 60-year-old would. They're going to assume I'm not technically savvy, which right. I am, by the way. They're going to assume a lot about me that mm -hmm. may or may not be true. And I might not get the 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 uh, assignments that mm -hmm. I can get. So there's also that there's people who are um, differently abled and because they're differently able, people think they have mental incapacities that they don't have and they don't give them the assignments that they, sh they could or should get. They don't get the, the uh, ability to speak in front of leadership. So there are many different types of identity-based privileges and we've got to talk about them all in the workplace but it takes leadership being able to identify when they have other leaders managers leads or staff who are who are contributing to this toxic culture within the organization oh absolutely and an inter intersection with the with bias so many absolutely bias that go with that and part of that is educating We've yes. been educating for the last two, three years on unconscious bias, but we haven't gone a level deeper to talk about the types of unconscious bias. We haven't mm -hmm. talked about necessarily gender bias as a particular thing, confirmation bias, attribution bias, uh, beauty bias, and you know all those different types of bias, conformity bias, Absolutely. all those different types of biases. As leaders, we need to be aware of because yes. we have them. I'm the first one to raise my hand and say, I got bias. I, yeah, right. I, we all do. Own it. OK, it's not about you having it. It's about how you exercise that bias. One, one, recognizing that you have it so you can identify it when you're going down that road or have people around you to help identify it when you're going down that road to prevent you. Stop, pause, breaks, Vic. Right. Hired three people from these eight, that same HBCU, bruh. And so I got a whole team of Black people. That doesn't mean I'm diverse. Right. It just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. I, yeah, it feels good. I got some folks around me and I, I created this great team, but I still got to be diverse too, right? Just you have to, we have to be diverse too. Absolutely. We got to be diverse. It's, it's funny. So Carla, you know, Carla on my team, mm -hmm. she, she brought out a fact that I did not recognize. Mm -hmm. So we, of course, we talk about affinity bias and she said, D, have you realized that all of your facilitators are black women oh no I didn't and I and, so guess what I, I use that 
when I when I'm training. I use myself as an example. And so I tell my class, look, here's the problem. I have been operating off of affinity bias. And it's because I'm comfortable with people who are more like me. So don't feel guilty and then hide your head in the sand. Like call a thing a thing. I have to call a thing a thing for me. Yes. Call a thing a thing. And so I know that if I go to my community of people and ask them, hey, I'm looking for a new trainer, I'm looking for a new facilitator, I'm looking for a new strategist. And if they're operating with their community looking just like them, and it goes out to the next layer and everybody's community, because I'm a black woman, looks like me, guess what resumes I'm going to get in? I'm going to get black women. Yep. So I have to be strategic and open myself up outside of my circle and expose myself differently, especially when I'm looking for people to add to my team. Now, that doesn't mean that if a black woman is the best person, she won't get the job, but it means I'll have a diverse pool of people to look from and to choose from and to evaluate. And so that's really important too. This, you know, we have curated our lives are curated by systemic privileges and oppression mm. because of identities we inherently have and those social advantages that uh, are within those different identities and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. So these privileges, when they're not called out, they're catalysts for racism, classism, sexism, xenophobia, and more. And so we have to talk about the large impact of toxic privilege. Now, I, I always, I always, I always want us to, and I'm looking at the time, we got about seven more minutes before we start looking at the questions. Mm -hmm. I always want to talk about solutions and we've kind of interspersed them, uh, mm -hmm. but I want to bring up some statistics first. And I know you have some statistics to share. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I want you to share yours. Uh, what, the one statistic that I love to share about toxic privilege is how the disengagement of staff because of that combination of bias and toxic privilege, which uh, equals a risk, risk to the organization. And it's when it's not addressed, it minimizes the trust in the leaders. It minimizes the trust in the organization. It creates an environment where people are not psychologically safe. And then there was a, a National Library of Medicine study that said more than 80% of employees suffer from disengagement. Many of that is tied to some form of privilege, yes. some form of bias mm -hmm. being uh, in the, within the culture of the organization and that we must identify these toxic privileges and biases to address them. And you can look at it from a standpoint of how it affects the bottom line when you don't have attrition, how it affects the bottom line when people are happy. I like to just talk about it's the right thing to do. It's simply the right thing to do. But I know you have some statistics. What do you have to share? No, no, it, it, it absolutely is the right thing to do. Uh, but saying that and doing that are two different things. I absolutely. Can't explain how many times over the last few years you've seen a CEO message that says, hey, we believe in diversity. I haven't, I, I can't tell you how many saying we're the best in diversity. Yes. Right? And we're the best in diversity because of one small segment, but they don't dive deeper. You're terrible in six of them, but you're good at one and you don't say that. So the information that you're providing is not credible information and you're making mm -hmm. people think that you're better than what you are. You need to take ownership when we talk about the, what we need to do. So we talk about uh, what organizations and leaders and talk about solutions. One, leaders need to hold their leaders accountable. Yes. The question is accountable to what? Let's identify that early on and hold them yes. accountable, make sure they know that they are held accountable. They can choose whether they want to work there. Mm -hmm. These items around the place, right? Uh, right. When, let's look at the data with diverse eyes. When I told you about, when, when we talked a little bit about the investigators, when we talk a little bit about HR, what does HR look like? What is the, what is what does the investigations look like? The people who are doing investigation, um, and how comfortable are you with sharing the data? Why is it so hard right. to get data from HR around race, ethnicity, and and gender? Why is it so difficult to get that real good data? Why is it so mm -hmm. difficult 
people to understand how people are positioned in places in this organization that are well below their education. Because you're you're a woman, Daryl, and you need to be an administrative assistant, and you're sitting on right. two master's degrees, but your boss only has a high school diploma. What? Right. <laughs> what? Count it. Come on. It Count makes it. sense. So let me just throw this out there because we're talking about gender and I was on this gender and I'm really proud to have worked for these four ladies over these years because I've learned a lot um, and, and uh, 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 what it means to work for a male dominated organization versus a female dominated organization. When I say mm -hmm. from a perspective, not the number of um, and the perspective we get. Um, companies above average gender diversity and employment engagement perform 46% to 58% better compared to those below average diversity and employment engagement. Listen to that number, 46 to 50 mm -hmm. better. So when we talk about uh, earlier, when we said there's a misconception that it's profitable to be, to oppress people because we're the number one country in the world, we really got to take into consideration that's not the case. That's, that's not right. Case. And, and we're not the number one country in the world in most aspects of economy. Let's just be mm -hmm. honest. Um, Fortune 500 companies have at least three directors as females, witness a 53% increase in ROI. Come on, that's three directors mm -hmm. on your board. Mm -hmm. Companies who, where women fill 30% of the roles saw a 6% increase in net profit margin. Uh, companies mm -hmm. with diverse culture captures new markets 70% more successfully than companies with poor diverse culture. So you're increasing your your, your, your impact, your, your, uh, your market share. Mm -hmm. And all these can be found. So I just wanted to share those when we talk about gender diversity, it is the right thing to do. And it's also the business thing to do. Right. We're in the business of making money. I'm not in the business of giving away stuff. It's not a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. This is a for-profit organization in business of making money. Right. I make money the best. And it sounds like I need to put more women in charge and me a more diverse culture. That's what it sounds like to me. Why is that? Well, what's interesting about that is, you know, there's also the connection to emotional intelligence. Women operate from an emotionally intelligent space. I won't say more than men, mm -hmm. um, because that would be my bias coming okay. forward. But I will say in the spaces that I've been in, um, I know that emotional intelligence is a factor that comes into play with that. You know, there's a, I shared it on my Facebook page and just last week I came across it somewhere and I thought it was amazing uh, in government throughout the U.S. Mm -hmm. And it took pictures and it took the men out of the picture and so mm -hmm. it might be a whole room of men. Mm -hmm. And then when you take the men out, you have six women and you see the disparity. Or when you think about, and Carla uh, can speak to this, uh, when you think about um, the committee, the governmental committee on women's health until two years ago, maybe three years ago, how did the committee look? all men mm -hmm. making decisions about women's health come you on you know when we, when we, we like i don't we don't go there I, with I it. oh my goodness some equipment that you don't really know about uh because you don't have it from a lived experience so how can no women be included in the decisions that are happening from a health committee standpoint nationally i'm not talking about supreme court decisions i'm talking about from a presidentially uh, convened committee that's gonna make decisions. We have to look at, and we've talked a lot about gender, but again, it goes with race, it goes with uh, social economic status, all of those areas, there are identity disparities that we have to call out. I wanna say this, that when it comes to people within the organization, it's important for all of us to recognize toxic privilege. Yeah. It's important for us to embrace it, that it's there. And I'm saying embrace it, not from a, 
it is what it is standpoint, but it embrace it from a, it's something we have to manage and we have to uh, uh, figure out a way to uncover it so that we can eliminate it and, and admit it. And it's not about character assassination. It's not a character assessment. It's looking at the organization and identifying where you need to do the work mm -hmm. so that toxic privilege cannot just uh, infiltrate the culture of the organization. When we look at doing the work and sometimes people say, well, if you keep talking about it, it's just gonna stay relevant. No, what happens when you don't talk about it? Cause we've not talked about things for a long time. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's gotten worse. Mm -hmm. So not talking about it is not the answer. We've tried that. Right. Not just and, and just getting along is not the answer. Right. People have tried that too. Mm -hmm. We got to call a thing a thing and we have to be strategic about how we address it. Yes. Um, so you talked about the change of accountability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it is that we have to hold, and I'm talking about all employees in the organization. I'm talking about supervise, leads, supervisors, managers, directors. Everyone has to hold the higher level uh, leadership accountable. Yeah. They have to hold them accountable. And I know many times people don't feel like they have the tools or they don't have the right or they don't have the space and the grace to be able to speak up. And I always say, you have to jump in. You have to jump in and risk. People have to take that risk. There's a, a, a book switch, I've mentioned it before, and it's a change management book. And I look at, at change management and everything I do, and it talks about the elephant and the rider. And so the, the elephant is two tons. It represents the organization. The rider is 200 pound man. It represents the leadership. Most organizations that I've ever worked with have a lot more people, individual contributors, leads, supervisors, whatever, then it has the executive leadership team. Mm -hmm. And if that rider is prodding that elephant and they get to a fork in the road, as long as the elephant is going the way the rider wants it to go, it's gonna go that way. Well, think about company culture. If the organization is not moving the culture, company co culture in the way you want it to go, there's power in numbers. Mm -hmm. to move it in the direction you want it to go. So I, I, I hope that people understand you have more power than you think you have. Yeah. And we need to use that power to change the culture of the organizations that we want to be in. Yeah, my young, so, brother, from New Jersey, my young brother from New Jersey who just started the, the first Amazon union, right? He's, he's a definitely catalyst in that, in that piece. Yes. You can make a difference, right? Uh, yes. But you, you're absolutely a hundred percent correct. And I even wrote some notes cause I'm gonna take it back and part of my presentation with some of my clients. Uh, you're, you're completely on target. Mm -hmm. There is power in the people. There's power. There's power in the people. Um, also, we understand that mid-management usually acts as this, the, the, the gatekeeper of whether mm -hmm. to make this change or not, All right? Executive leaders can have a policy, can have a pleasure. I, and I even question who's making the policy, by the way. Right. I'm not doing a gender policy without having people of the gender making a policy. That mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the whole abortion thing as well. I got a bunch of white men making this mm -hmm. of, uh, women's uh, 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 bodies that doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. Uh, mm -hmm. But when it comes to policies and procedures, who implement it and what, how are we holding them accountable to those policies and procedures? That's and, right. You know, so is it on paper or is it not? That's what runs this country. Paper and ink on paper run mm -hmm. the country. And if it's not written, you can't fall back and say to anyone, uh, or that's usually the default. Well, I'm abiding by the policies and procedures and mm -hmm. the loopholes that I'm going to use to get to where I want to go. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure we tighten up those policies. Let's make sure right. we tighten up those procedures so that yes. you prevent. And 
let's recognize that we're not going to get it right always the first time the room is right get it right the first time so let's go back and make some adjustments but part of that that adjustment we got to implement justice in this as well so Mm -hmm. so we make it great for the future you still have people who are sitting in their roles right now who have been unjustly hurt and how are we making them whole and, Mm -hmm. and moving forward so Daryl, and again, I'm putting you as an administrative assistant with two master's degrees sitting under this person who has strategically in your evaluation uh, uh, wrote in there, I wouldn't use the word derogatory, but it wasn't something that's gonna help you increase your, uh, your, 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 your growth in the company. Right. Because they held you down for whatever reason, listen, whatever reason it may have been, how are we justifying, how are we gonna make things better for you how are we going to give you just uh, justice for the, uh, the, the the injustice that you had to, to, to work through during that entire period? Mm-hmm. Not to consider that as well. And I think we need to do it. People call it reparations. You can call it whatever it is. I'm saying, if you're going to do the right thing, it's not about doing the right thing moving forward. It's about correcting the bad behaviors that you have done to those people that are there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Carla, do we have, uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions uh, in the chat box. I know there were a lot coming through. (laughs) Sure. One of the earlier um, questions slash comments we had was when you started off the discussion comparing um, the, uh, how a Black woman has the same qualities as perhaps a white man, but they're perceived differently. So a question came in and said, if a man has too much or perceived as having too much passion, do you believe that he should tone it down to make others comfortable around him at work? Yes, I can start that. Uh, The objective here is not to uh, minimize or exuberate or exalt, exalt um, any person's particular um, behaviors unless there were inappropriate behaviors. Right. So to accept, not, not minimize a man's passion, but accept that a woman has the same passion as a man. <laughs> How about that? That's How about, it. I, I lead with acceptance and I lead with love and, and I lead with hey, this is that person and I recognize their styles. Now, if their styles are inappropriate, have that discussion. But if your mm-hmm. style is, is mimicking mine, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, it's, it's, I need to be open to that and recognizing that the reason I put you, the reason you're in this room is because I need you to think differently, act differently, see things differently, view things differently. That's why I need you. And if I need, if I, or else I would have a bunch of me's in the room and I don't want that. That's not going to be the question. And I think uh, the, the point that I totally agree with, I agree with everything he said, but I think the point that I totally agree with is uh, unless your, your passion and your attitude or your, your expression is inappropriate, allow people to be who they are. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, especially with women and with people from the L- men from the LGBTQ plus community, their emotional uh, descriptions show up far too much on their evaluations, their formal evaluations. Mm-hmm. And so we have to look at how are we describing what we see in people? Are we describing the emotional components throughout the board? with all identities or are we just associating those emotional components to certain identities? And we have to be very careful about that. Mm -hmm. Great, and then just one last question um, coming from Brian. How would you recommend someone deal with perceived the perception that human resources defends unconscious bias in upper level management or in the uh, executive level or the C-suite? How would an employee deal with that? So for one of the things that I'll say is <laughs> I, I document everything and then I, I show it back to them. And so the other thing that's important to me is to find an ally that's at a higher level within the organization that I trust 
that I can have the conversation with, knowing the culture of your HR and knowing the culture of your leadership team of how to address it. Sometimes someone that's on that same level needs to be able to call it out to them because you won't be able to. Um, so knowing when that time happens and having someone that you can speak to and help advocate for you is really important. But in the absence of that, and my first approach is, because I like to handle things myself, I'm going to document all situations and have a conversation with HR and show them where their biases are and show them how their biases are affecting me. Yeah. So, so Darlene, you're, you're, you're better than me. <laughs> I'm going to say that right off the bat. You are better than me in this aspect. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I work for four Fortune 500 companies. I can, I, I, you, if I heard the question correctly, how do I defend HR from thinking people have unconscious bias? I can't defend HR. I do believe. No, I can't defend them. Mm -mm. Can't defend HR. I do believe that they, uh, as HR, and B being an executive, I know this for, we are defending the company and not right. necessarily the people. What mm -hmm. I want to impress upon, if I ever had the opportunity to own an HR team, would be the people run this company. There is no company without the people. And we have to ensure that the people's health and well being are taken care of. It's not about the necessarily the mid managers. Uh, we need to take into consideration the, the, the systematic approach to how we do business internally. And if that's a problem and a systematic, that's a big problem. We need to own it, not hide from it. Now, mm -hmm. so this is why I say I'm better, uh, you're better than me, because um, I come from a place where in California, one of the utilities here have been sued twice by African-Americans, class action lawsuit, and twice have they won. Okay, twice. Love. The reason the suit had to come is because they tried an organic approach to solving this issue and it didn't work. And it mm -hmm. didn't work because HR was preventing information from getting out, uh, uh, elongating the process of, uh, uh, of addressing the issue in a way that was gonna meet the needs of these African-Americans for a bunch of a myriad of, of reasons. And so the only way that they were able to get that data is to sue. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how do we get to HR? We need to request that data and HR can't come to a court and say, we don't have it because the court's going to say, go get it. Right, they have it. Then that is when I'm able to take it to an HR. That's or HR says, okay, well, uh, let's see if we can solve this issue because now we're recognizing. I'm going to tell mm -hmm. you, if I don't want to look at something, if I don't want to, you know, ignorance is bliss. So if I don't want to look at it, because I think it might be, I'm not going to look at it because mm -hmm. I don't want to know. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I say that even when I give this, uh, this, this talk to clients on a, on a professional level, um, I say that as clients, as the owners of this business, you need to be aware that if in fact you don't do this, and, and be open and, and, and be authentic in your giving of information and mm -hmm. be transparent, you could face this and you will then have to do it. And it's not a good situation when you have to do it. Right. So what right. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. I'm sorry we can't take more questions. We got to talking and we went a little bit over time, okay. but yeah. that's what, for some reason we seem to do that. Yes. Um, as we close out today, a couple of things that I want to share with you. Number one, we do have a, a free video uh, mini course and it talks about privilege and what privilege is. So please, please, please drop your email address in the chat box and we'll send you the, the mini course on privilege. It's just, you know, three minutes to really help people understand what privilege means. Uh, and you can share that with anybody that you would like to share it with. Also, I want to say, you know, and I think about this, I heard this analogy some time ago. And to me, it's a great one. It is a hammer was originally crafted as a tool. But shortly thereafter, someone figured out how to use it as a weapon. Conversely, privilege 
was crafted as a weapon to oppress others. But we collectively, each of us can use our privilege as a tool. And when we're in spaces where we don't hold a privilege, it's important to understand that there are other people that do hold them accountable. Hold those people accountable for learning to speak up on your behalf. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna say that one other time, one more time, because I think when I heard this, I was like, it's, it's perfect. A hammer was originally crafted as a tool, but someone figured out how to use it as a weapon. Privilege was originally crafted as a weapon, but we can use it as a tool. Man, where's your microphone so you can drop it? Let me drop it. Boom. Ah, yes. <laughs> All right. This was a great discussion. Dr. Vic, he, we welcome him back a lot. Janine will be with us next month. Uh, so always look out for us on ELD uh, Global on our LinkedIn page where we have our events. And I think one of the questions that we might want to talk about, Dr. Baker, uh, so let's keep this on our list is that question about HR, like what to do when HR is defending leadership as opposed to supporting and empowering their people. I think that's a good conversation to have. And I have all the answers. Uh, yeah, let's get it, but people aren't- Let's get it done. All it right. It requires work, <laughs> so let's get it. <laughs> it does, it I does. I can talk about that. Thank you for having me, Darlin. This has been great. Oh, absolutely. The audience is wonderful. Appreciate you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and we'll be signing off in just a minute.